Would you stand with me and join in our song, Oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing. Now, some of us get mad because we have one, or our husbands or wives or children have one tongue. Can you imagine a thousand tongues? But you know what? We're joining a thousand tongues this morning because we're joining the heavenly hosts and singing praise to our Father. All right, Lyman, hit it. I got out in the foyer talking with people, didn't even realize it was church time. <laughs> that never happens to any of y'all. So I have to come back there and get my earbud in a minute. Um, as we come together, we do so anticipating Thursday. Football! No. Turkey! No. Stuffing! No. We celebrate Thanksgiving. The opportunity to give thanks for all that we have received. This shouldn't be a holiday. This should be an everyday. And so as we come together this morning, let us give thanks to the Lord for He is good. His love, His mercy, His kindness, His grace abides forever. As we open this morning, I want to come to a word of prayer. There is a ton of folks, and if you want to take out your pencil and scribble on your prayer list, there are some folks that could really use a touch from the Lord this week. Some of you are aware that Kathy Warren was placed in hospital a couple of days ago. She has contracted pneumonia, and it's a bacterial, so they pushed two days of antibiotics into her, and they're anticipating sending her home this afternoon. So she's recovering well, and things are going good, but continue to be praying for her. Um, my mother and father fell uh, Friday morning, and I'm now calling them the Domino Twins because he fell and then she fell, and uh, mom is recovering well. The big old goose egg on her head has gone down, but she looks like somebody hit her in the face with a parking lot. Uh, she's got the purple, it, it's, but she's healing and she's doing well. Continue to pray for her. Those of you who attended the Thursday night uh, thank, community Thanksgiving uh, may May be aware that Bob Perkins struggled with a stroke uh, that evening. He is one of our leaders in our Gideon's camp. He's also associate out at Valley View Baptist and is a phenomenal man of God that I just love dearly. Uh, he is speaking. He is regaining some of the use on his left side, but he is probably going to wind up in some rehab for a while and as he processes through this. So be in prayer for Bob Perkins. Um, for me, um, I know that I'm already on the list, and y'all have been already praying for me. Uh, I loved it. Daniel looked over me a few days ago. He says, well, so how does it feel to be cured? I said, I don't know. Ask me when I get over the cure. You know, sometimes the cure is worse than the disease. Well, I praise God. The cancer's gone, but now i got to get all those cancers. 
Amen. And then now we got to get the rest of those chemicals out of me so I can get back to normal. Um, so continue there. And uh, Layla approached me this morning. Jen, the young lady she had with her last week, has had some kind of a medical emergency. They life flighted her out yesterday. Uh, and they're, they're, they're still trying to figure out what's going on with her, be in prayer for her. And then Ed visited with me this morning, and he's been diagnosed with leukemia. And so we need to be in prayer for him as he begins the treatments and the chemo and the things that are going on. And, and just watch out and, and watch over for him as he goes through this. And I know that you guys are aware that we have a very long prayer list. I've had several of you come up to me and say, how come we got such a long prayer list? Because people understand this is a praying church. Because people understand we have a prayer answering God. And so we want to list all of these things out and make you aware, not so that we can gossip down at Murdy Maze, but so that we can actually be in prayer for those who need a touch from the hand of God. Let's open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for the opportunity that we have to come and to give you thanks. Lord, we could stand here and just say thank you for an hour and a half and it would be time well spent. Lord God, you are worthy of praise and adoration and thanksgiving. We give you praise for every one of these needs that's been lifted up before us. Not because we're happy the situation is here, but we're happy that we know that you walk with each and every one of those individuals, that they do not face these dark days alone, that they do not face these pains and these injuries and these illnesses without your grace. We do grieve, Lord, but it's not with as those that have no hope. We grieve with the knowledge that you are right there with us grieving. I'm so very thankful for your example at the tomb of Lazarus, knowing full well that you were about to restore, you were about to redeem, you were about to bring back to life your fallen friend. Still you stood at that tomb entrance and you wept. You shared in our grief, you shared in our pain. And Lord, it's such a beautiful picture of what you have been doing for us since the beginning of the world. When we chose sin instead of you and grieved your heart, that you have continuously reached out to us as a nurturing father to redeem us, to restore us, to heal us, to bring us back into right relationship with you and with your creation. And we thank you for walking with us. Lord, we lift up each and every one of these requests. We reach out to all that are on our prayer list. Lord, we pray for those who didn't even know to ask for prayer. So often, Lord God, you answer prayers we are not even smart enough to ask. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you for all of your gifts and your bounty and your benefit. Thank you for this family that we can lean on. Thank you for the family that we either came from or raised ourselves. Those families of origin and the families of creation that we've made, Lord God, we thank you for them as well. We thank you for our friends and our co-workers. We thank you for those who have a voice in our world and who allow our voice to echo in their ears. We're thankful, Lord God, for the bounty that we have. Lord, the worst day in the United States is still better than most days in most countries of the world. And we thank you for that bounty. It's not because of our land, it's not because of our people, and it's not because of our politics. It's because of your gl glory and grace and bounty to us. And I pray, Lord God, that you would cause us as Americans to live worthy of that blessing. I ask, Lord God, that you would receive this day a thanksgiving praise that everything that we do and say might be pleasing unto you to bring you all that you deserve so richly, so bountifully. We love you, Lord. We honor you and we give you thanks. In Christ's name, amen. 400 years ago, roughly, first Thanksgiving, not a holiday until much later, but a time where two peoples came together and found a way to live together, survive in the wilderness, learn from each other. And I can't help but think there may have been some of those folks we call pilgrims that must have shared the love of God with those Native Americans who were very instrumental in saving their lives. And so we are a nation of people from different backgrounds, 
different societies, different social settings, diff different educations, all that, who come together to be a thankful people. So today's service is from what I'm sensing, because I have no idea what the Lord's given him to share with us, but from what I'm sensing, this is all about Thanksgiving. It's about giving thanks. Amen. So we're going to sing a song that was written X number of years ago, Come Ye Thankful People, Come, and walk through what harvest is. And for us as Christians, it's harvest of the souls. But it's coming together as people who are thankful. final harvest home gather thou thy people in free from sorrow free from sin if this isn't I'll fly away I don't know what is if this isn't when the roll is called to yonder this is how they sang it then amen would you be seated please don't go anywhere now if somewhere along in these next moments you need to stand and take a stretch, you are welcome to stand and take a stretch. But I have something I need to share with you first. And I checked it out. We don't have special music. We sang short songs. It's mine. <laughs> See what happens when you go away? I want to talk just for a moment about giving thanks. Because I know what we pray for. And I know how gracious we, we really are for things, for our salvation, for Jesus, who not only died for us, not only promised us eternity in God, but also showed us the way how to do it. Has given us the opportunity to love and to share. But there are so many other things we don't think about that we can be thankful for. And I don't mean I got up this morning. I mean other things, like the time the Spirit spoke to you and said, that person needs your prayer. 
Like the time someone, the, the Holy Spirit spoke to you and said, someone's hungry and needs your bowl of soup. Like the time he said, okay, that guy cut you off, but be graceful for I have given you grace. Or the time that you said, God, I can't do this. And the Holy Spirit says, that's why I'm here. Or the time that he says, you're going to go through a rough time. Sometimes he tells us ahead of time. You're getting ready to go through something. Hang on. The hang on is, hold my hand, because I'm going to walk through it with you. The testimony of those who said, I've been healed of this, or I've been touched of that, or I'm released from this. And it may not seem like a big deal to you, but to, to them, it changed their whole life. The time that my washing machine broken down, and I was a newly divorced woman with four children. I know this. Wait a minute. Seven, seven five, four, three, and one. And the washing machine broke down, and I didn't have enough money to buy a washing machine, or to change it, or to fix it. And my seven-year-old daughter said, Mom, why don't you lay hands on it? Only she said, Mom, why don't you lay hands on it? And to me, hands meant a sledgehammer, because I was just like, what am I going to do? But she, she took me by the hand and walked me down that basement. And we put our hands in that washing machine. And it started up, and it worked for another 10 years. Because of the faith of my daughter, not because of me, but because of the faith of my daughter who said, God's got this. Not a big deal to you, but when you've got two still in dirty diapers and I didn't have disposables, it's a big deal. The car doesn't start. The dishwasher doesn't work. The clothes don't fit. The, the uh, rain is, is flooding. It just goes on and on and on, and I haven't even started on the body. We had a, a member come in this morning, and she could barely walk. And God had been telling me all week long, even though I wasn't here, I was in California, to pray for her. And the minute I saw her, I knew why he had said pray for her. I came home to find out someone else that I love dearly is ill. And all I wanted to do was go and hug him, and then I thought, well, I better tell his, his lady first. Because when I go and hug this man, because that's all I want to do is just let him know that God loves him. Every one of you have walked through something in your life that means give thanks. You don't have to say it to all of us, although we love to share in what God has done. But you have been to his altar and asked for help, and you have gotten it. Give thanks for the little things. Give thanks for his awesomeness. Give thanks for his sovereignty. Give thanks when we had two of our piano players out, he brings Lyman. I'm giving thanks. Give thanks that I see people here that I know that it's hard to get here, that you have some hurts, you have some things in your life that make you feel less than who you are, but I'm here to declare that you are a daughter and a son of the King of Kings. And when he said, do you, and you said, I do, that was it. You belong to him. He will get you through the tough times. He will get you through the easy times. That's when we tend to slip, when it's easy, or forget. He will get you to the calling that he has called upon your life. All you have to do is open your heart and open your ears and take a step. And I promise you, promise you, and there are many people in here who can promise you that God will provide. He will provide. He will be there. Now, he and I have issues on timing, but I yield to the fact, because he has never failed, that his timing is the perfect time. It is. It just is. So this morning, we're going to sing Give Thanks, a simple song. But as you sing this, I want you I'm asking the Holy Spirit to open your minds and remind you of all the big things, the little things, the mundane things, the routine things that he has been faithful in your life. And when you sing, give thanks, 
tick them off, check them off. Thank you for this. Thank you for this. Thank you for this. Thank you for this. Now, what I would really love to do is say, come up to the altar and give thanks. That's what I would love to do. And say, this is where you give thanks. This is as close at times. It's not as close. This is not true. It's just that I like it to come here because I feel like I'm really, really close to him. When I come up to his altar, his altar of sacrifice, it's another way of thanking. I'm not going to ask you all to get up and do that. If you want to, that's your due. But when you sing this, let's start checking off the boxes in our life of how many times God showed up. Right? I know. Because I know some of your testimonies. Right? I know. I know. Right? Absolutely. like to go ahead and come up. This is the last Sunday of the liturgical calendar, and today we celebrate the Feast of Christ the King. We remember the sovereignty of Christ, who is Lord of all creation, and is coming again in glory, and he will reign for eternity. Therefore, that's why we have the white linens out, to represent the hope that we have in Christ. 
the hope that we have in Christ our King. From Revelation 1, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood and made us to be a kingdom, priests serving his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds. Every eye will see, even those who pierced him, and on his account all of the tribes of the earth will wail. So it is to be. Amen. I am the Alpha and Omega, says the Lord God who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. You see, Christ entered this world to offer the ultimate sacrifice for us. He hung on a cross, the blood draining from his body so that we might be covered by that blood and we might be made righteous to join him. As the men are passing the elements among you this morning, let us take this time to remember Jesus. Remember your sins that he has covered. Remember the patience that he has with us. And take this time to talk with him, remembering what these elements represent, asking for his forgiveness, asking him to answer those deepest, darkest prayers in your heart. Well, Father God, magnificent, almighty, our beginning and our end, rule over us. Guide us daily to be faithful to remember you. In every moment of every day, help us to live our lives in worship of our Savior and our Sovereign, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in unity with the Holy Spirit. Amen. According to history, this year, the United States will celebrate the 400th anniversary of the first Thanksgiving. In November of 1621, after the fir Pilgrim's first successful corn harvest, the governor of Plymouth, Massachusetts, William Bradford, organized a celebratory feast that lasted three days, and it started the tradition of recognizing that God provides. For you see, in 1623, after a, after a bit of a drought, Governor Bradford made this first Thanksgiving proclamation. Inasmuch as the Great Father has given us this year an abundant harvest, and he has spared us from pestilence and disease, and has granted us freedom to worship him according to the dictates of our own conscience, now I, your magistrate, do proclaim that all ye pilgrims do gather at ye meeting house between the hours of 9 and 12 in the daytime on Thursday, November 29th, of the year of our Lord, 1623, there to render thanks Thanksgiving to the Almighty God for all of his blessings. Now, off and on through the years, Thanksgiving was celebrated, but as of October 3rd, 1789, George Washington made the first presidential proclamation for Thanksgiving when he said, whereas it is the duty, the duty of all nations to acknowledge the providence of the Almighty God, to obey his will, to be grateful for his benefits, and humbly to implore his protection and favor. And whereas both houses of Congress have requested me to recommend to the people of the United States a day of public thanksgiving and prayer, to be observed by acknowledging with grateful hearts the many favors of the Almighty God, especially by affording them an opportunity to establish a form of government for their safety and happiness. Now, therefore, I do recommend and assign Thursday, the 26th day of November next, to be devoted by the people of these states to the service of that great and glorious being who is the beneficent author of all that is good, that was, that is, and that will be. So it began that the, the government actually recognized that people were celebrating Thanksgiving. 
Then on October 3rd, 1863, Abraham Lincoln, in the middle of the Civil War, issued a proclamation establishing the first national holiday. No human counsel hath devised, nor hath any mortal hand worked out these great things. They are the gracious gifts of the highest God who hath remembered mercy. It has seemed to me fit and proper that they should be solemnly and reverently and gratefully acknowledged as with one heart and voice by the whole American people. I do therefore invite my fellow citizens to set apart and observe the last Thursday of November as a day of thanksgiving. Well, this Thursday, most of us will be meeting with family and friends. We'll have a big meal. We'll sit around. We'll reminisce. We'll share tall tales. We'll maybe watch a little football, maybe play a few games. You see, Thanksgiving has just become another holiday for our country. We have certain traditions. We have certain practices. But we forget why. Because we're thanking God that he gave us this country. We're thanking God that he provides for us every single day. We are thanking God for the blessings that he has given. Today I ask you to think about your lives. There's not a person in this room that isn't blessed. And God blesses you, not only to provide for you, but also to provide for others. And part of that provision is through the church. So let us remember those blessings as the tithes and the offerings are collected today. And with thanksgiving in your heart, may you be generous. Thank you, Father God, for the blessings of this life and the blessings to come. May the offerings that are received today spread your name and your love next door and to the farthest reaches. May everything we do bring honor and glory to you. And finally, Heavenly Father, please accept our thanks for all that you have given us, individually and corporately. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Exodus, picking back up in chapter 13. Exodus. Return the belongings. What? Okay, we'll get there. When we left off in Exodus, back in chapter 12, we left off on a day of great celebration and a day of great fear. The people of Israel were delivered out of Egypt. Yeah! They had also seen ten plagues at the hand of an awesome God. So many times we as people say, you know, I wish God would just show up. Be careful what you wish for. Because we serve an awesome God who, contrary to popular belief, is neither our concierge nor our servant. As part of the instructions then, as to how the Israelites were to live now that they were free from slavery, God begins to outline his expectations and describes our relationship with him. God is so good to take us out of where we are and grow us into what he wants us to be and tell us what that looks like. He gives us the end goal and we can look at it and say, I, I don't think I'm capable of that. Newsflash, you're not. <laughs> he never asked you to be. He asked you to be willing to yield so that he could do those things in your life. But you have a part to play. And so as we come to Exodus 13, this seems out of timing. Here you can just see all of these people marching. They've left Egypt. They're officially in the middle of nowhere. And God's still talking in Moses' ear. 
as though he didn't have enough things to be thinking about. He's got two and a half million people walking out of a nation. He's got to cross water barriers or go around them. He's got to figure out where to get them food, where to get them water, where to get this, where to get that. Oh, wait. No, he doesn't. We sometimes fail to recognize that Moses is not in charge. Moses was just the first old dude with a stick in the parade. Everybody was following him because he was following God. So Moses didn't need to worry about food, didn't need to worry about water, didn't need to worry about whether we were supposed to take that left turn at Albuquerque. All he needed to do was listen and obey. And so God is beginning to speak into his ear the things that will go on through Deuteronomy and Numbers and Leviticus as they continue to walk for these coming years. God will continuously speak to Moses the things that Moses was to put in our ears so that we would know God. So let's look at Exodus chapter 13, beginning at verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, Consecrate to me every firstborn male. The first offspring of every womb among the Israelites belongs to me, whether man or animal. And then Moses said to the people, Commemorate this day, the day you came out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, because the Lord brought you out of it with a mighty hand. Eat nothing containing yeast. Today, in the month of Abib, you are leaving. When the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Hivites, Jebusites, the land he swore to your forefathers to give you, a land flowing with milk and honey, you are to observe this ceremony in this month. For seven days eat bread made without yeast, and on the seventh day hold a festival to the Lord. Eat unleavened bread during those seven days. Nothing with yeast is to be seen among you, nor shall any yeast be seen anywhere within your borders. On that day tell your son, I do this because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. This observance will be for you like a sign on your hand and a reminder on your forehead that the law of the Lord is to be on your lips. For the Lord brought you out of Egypt with His mighty hand. You must keep this ordinance at the appointed time year after year. After the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites and gives it to you, as he promised on oath to you and your forefathers. You are to give over to the Lord the first offspring of every womb. All the firstborn males of your livestock belong to the Lord. Redeem with a lamb every firstborn donkey, but if you do not redeem it, break its neck. Redeem every firstborn among your sons. In days to come, when your son asks you, What does this mean? Say to him, With a mighty hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. When Pharaoh stubbornly refused to let us go, the Lord killed every firstborn in Egypt, both man and animal. This is why I sacrifice to the Lord the first male offspring of every womb and redeem each of my firstborn sons. And it will be like a sign on your hand and a symbol on your forehead that the Lord brought us out of Egypt with his mighty hand. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter. For God said, if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by the desert road toward the Red Sea. The Israelites went up out of Egypt armed for battle. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him because Joseph had made the sons of Israel swear an oath. 
He said, God will surely come to your aid, and then you must carry my bones up with you from this place. After leaving Sukkot, they camped at Etham on the edge of the desert. By day, the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so that they could travel by day or night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. There are so many lessons that I want to try to unpack for you out of this passage. And so I'm going to relook at some of these passages in a different order because there are various different pieces sandwiched between other pieces. So I want to pull them out and look at them in total. To begin with, I want to talk to the idea of the firstborn as a remembrance. Verses 1 through 2 and verses 11 through 13 of this chapter tie together. And then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Sanctify to me every firstborn, the first offspring of every womb among the sons of Israel, both man and beast, it belongs to me. Jump down to verse 11. Now when the Lord brings you to the land of the Canaanite, as he swore to you and to your fathers, and gives it to you, you shall devote to the Lord the first offspring of every womb, from the first offspring of every beast that you own. The males belong to the Lord. But every first offspring of a donkey you shall redeem with a lamb. But if you do not redeem it, then you shall break its neck. And every firstborn of man among your sons you shall redeem. A word on donkeys. Donkeys are not ceremonially clean. Every other animal that the Israelites raised, they could sacrifice because it was a ceremonially clean animal. Donkeys weren't. So they used a lamb to redeem or buy back that donkey. So there was still a sacrifice. It was still a gift to God. Sanctify. Consecrate. But not just sanctify and consecrate. Sanctify or consecrate to me, says the Lord. It's not just giving it. It's not giving it to the priests. It's not giving it to the leaders because there weren't any priests yet. It wasn't giving it to the church. It wasn't giving it to your preferred ministry. It was giving it to God. Sanctifying that which we have back to the use and purpose of God. Shouldn't that be what we do with everything we have? Why just the firstborn? Isn't everything that God gives us for the purpose of God's use? Consecrate to me. You see, just as the Israelites were the first fruit among all of the nations, so the firstborn male of each womb was to remind them of that choosing. To remind them of that providence. Now, the interesting thing is this practice will only go on for a very few years because by the time we get to Numbers chapter 3 and verse 12, God will replace the giving of the firstborn with the taking of the Levites as the priests. They become the firstborn amongst Israel. But what was the point? They were to be sanctified. They were to be consecrated. And those are words we don't use in our world today. So let me help you with that. It is to set aside from common usage to sacred usage. You don't get to use it on what you want to use it on. You give it to God so that He might use it on what He wants to use it on the word redemption is lost in our culture as well. We are to redeem our sons. We are to redeem our animals. What is that? Well, the word redeem comes from the idea of to buy at a price. To buy back. A lease, if you will. That thing belongs to someone else, but I would like to use it. And so, can I pay for the purchase 
of using that for a time. You see, redemption has to do with paying a price to take something as yours that is not yours. It still belongs to that. The interesting thing to me, as I consider these sacrifices that God is setting up, as we will get to later in Exodus and into the other books of the Pentateuch, the cool thing is, the sacrifice when they were given to God was a meal sacrifice. Which means, you still got to eat it. You brought that lamb because it was the firstborn and you sacrificed it to God and he made it a picnic. You got to sit down and eat that lamb with God. You got to share that lamb with the priests and with the nation of Israel, with the poor. With the, you got to use this thing to do God's purpose. He wants to commune with you. You get to eat. He needs to provide for his ministers. They get to eat. The widows and the orphans, as Jesus said, will always be with you. They need to be provided for too. That's what God would do with our money. That's what God would do with our things. That's what God would do with our stuff. He would bless us and he would bless others. How often we choose to only bless us. You see, in this very picture of redemption, we get to see the lesson that God was trying to teach this brand new nation. They got to eat the sacrifice. They have a dependence on Him. He's going to give them food and water as they walk around the desert for the next 40 years. He's going to take care of them that their shoes won't wear out and their clothing won't get threadbare. He's going to provide for them. They can depend on Him. And then we get to celebrate that providence. Friends, Thanksgiving isn't about turkey. The turkey reminds us that God provides for us. The turkey is simply a reminder. That thing that we get to eat in a feast of Thanksgiving is simply there to remind us that we have something to celebrate. The thankfulness that we have because God has provided. This also served as a reminder of the Exodus. Every single time they held this feast, they were reminded that they too, whatever generation they came from, had been redeemed from slavery. It hurts my heart that so many in our nation who come from a heritage of suppression and slavery still act as though they're slaves. We've been redeemed. And yes, that is a part of our history, but we can celebrate that it's not a part of our present. We can celebrate what God has done among us. This was a reminder of the Exodus. Friends, I don't know if you're... No, I know this. You're not old enough to remember. The pilgrims came here to get away from religious persecution. They came here not only celebrating that the Native Americans shared their corn, they also came here to celebrate the fact that they could finally worship God the way they thought was right and not be killed by the government for doing it. Thanksgiving has a place even in our modern era. Amen? And finally, this redemption was all about this communion with God. We got to eat the sacrifice that He gave us. He said, you have to give me that lamb. Okay, I'll give you this lamb. What are you going to do with it? Give it back. <laughs> what? Yeah. How many of you guys go to the fair and get one of those great big honking turkey legs? I'm all over those things. Can't wait for the fair to come. I love those turkey legs. A leg of lamb. Here. Wait, you asked me to give that to you. Yeah. I asked you to give it to me because it was mine. And I wanted you to remember that. 
but it's mine for the purpose of blessing you. The reality is, and God says it very clearly in here, it belongs to me. We sometimes think we own this planet. I mean, think about the way we go about it. Hey, nice new car. Is that yours? Yep, just bought it. So you own it. <laughs> Liar, the bank does. You get to drive it around, but the bank owns that car until you pay it off. You treat it like it's yours. Boy, how would our world be if we actually treated a rental car like it was borrowed from a dear friend? How different would the world be if we actually treated a property that belonged to the bank like it belonged to the bank in case we couldn't make the payments? See, God says, it belongs to me. It always has. It always will. Let me clarify some things in your mind here. There is nothing that does not belong to God. Yes, you did good work and were faithful to your job and were good stewards of your money so that you could retire with an income and you could now live out retirement life. Yes, you are currently using what skills and abilities that you have to work so that you can provide for your family and establish a household so that at some point, praise God, maybe I can retire. The job you have requires skills that God gave you, abilities that God gave you, experiences that God gave you, resiliency that God gave you. The money that we... Do you ever realize that money has absolutely no intrinsic value? Why is it that this shiny rock is valuable and this shiny rock isn't? Tell me why pyrite isn't more expensive and gold is so expensive. There are two rocks. Oh, but that one's precious. It's a rock! You know, it cracks me up. People go, well, we're no longer on the gold standard. Our money means nothing. Wait a minute. Gold means nothing. It's a rock! We made up its value. God owns the rocks and the paper and the cotton that we make money out of and the green ink that we use to spray on it. Everything belongs to God, which means then that we are stewards. Now there's a word you don't hear in America. It's not a part of our culture. It's not a part of who we are. The steward is not the guy standing at the bottom of the gangplank on the cruise ship waiting for you to... A steward is someone who works for a master taking care of everything that that master owns and never forgetting who owns it. God owns everything. We're stewards. You see, the responsibility for the care of this world is ours because that's what He asked us to do. The responsibility of leading people to God so that He can redeem and restore them is ours because that's what He gave us to do. Loving one another as we love ourselves is our responsibility because that's what He asked us to do. But friends, I can't love you like that. And I know you don't love me like that. Only God loving through you. You see, even the love that we share for one another is a gift of God. We love because He first loved us. Everything that we have, we have a responsibility to use well. Jesus had some pretty harsh stories about stewards that didn't do well with what He gave them to care for. I'm not going to preach those this morning, just saying they're in there. We then should seek to please our Master in how we use what He has bestowed to us. We should not begin to act like we own it. We should not begin to act like it's ours. We should not be like, well, I'm not sure if I can give this to the church. <laughs> One, you're not giving it to the church. Two, it's not yours to hoard. 
It's God's. Now, if he's made responsible for that, then you do have the responsibility to choose how you distribute that. But that ought to be out of a conversation with God, not your investment agent. Because it wasn't yours to start with. It won't be yours to end with. It's God's. We should seek to please the Master in how we use what is His. And we must remember that it is His to demand from us at any time and in any way. You own nothing. So giving and thanksgiving are intended by God for us to act as a remembrance that it is His and not ours. I mean, come on, firstborn sons? I only had one. You don't get that one. Oh, yes, I do. Because he's mine. But that's my son. No, he's not. He's my son. He's just yours for a season. Let that sink in, friends. Let, you, let your mind start to understand that, that we give to God and we give thanksgiving to God because we're reminded, <laughs> this isn't mine. This is a gift from Him. And I, as His steward, want to bless Him back. And part of this remembrance also has to come from this Feast of Unleavened Bread. As we look at verses 3 through 7, Moses said to the people, Remember this day in which you went out from Egypt from the house of slavery, for by a powerful hand the Lord brought you out from this place, and nothing leavened shall be eaten. Paragraph. Stop. Jesus teaches us later in the book that leaven is equal to sin. A little sin leavens the whole loaf. Be aware of the leaven of the Pharisees. God is not interested in whether or not you eat crackers or sourdough. He's interested in us learning the lesson of leaven being equal to sin. And God's requirement of His people, not so that they could be free, but in thanksgiving because they were free, was to get the leaven out of their lives. On this day in the month of Abib, you are to go forth. It shall be when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Hivite, the Jebusite, which he swore to your fathers to give you, a land flowing with milk and honey, that you shall observe this right in this month. For seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day there shall be a feast to the Lord. Unleavened bread shall be eaten throughout the seven days, and nothing leavened shall be seen among you, nor shall any leaven be seen among you in all your borders. Every time you hear the word leaven, stick in the word sin. Get the sin out of your life and celebrate the feast of the Lord that that's even possible. Because I can't get sin out of my life. I will not list for you what I've done this week. Probably this morning there's been a couple I need to talk to God about. But through His righteousness and through His grace, He gives the abundance that that sin is lessened in my world every single day because I come focused on Him and not on me. See, even the unleavening of the bread is a gift of His and something more to celebrate. But this idea of living a sinless life, to live a life without leaven, to live a life without sin permeating and causing air bubbles in the middle of your life, you ever realize what yeast does? It breaks down the sugars and makes air bubbles, which makes the thing blow up. So what have you done? You've taken a cracker and you've made it this tall. Why? Because it's full of hot air. Boy, that'll preach. Remember. Never forget. Salvation is provided by God. By His will by His power and according to His plan and His timing. 
remember, celebrate by avoiding the leaven of sin. Set yourselves apart. Just as I ask you to set the firstborn apart as a remembrance, I'm asking you to set yourselves apart as a remembrance. And oh, by the way, don't worry about what you're going to eat or what you're going to drink or what you're going to wear for the pagans concern themselves about these things. <laughs> I've already given you a land, a land that will be provided by God, a land that is rich and abundant. And what is that? that I, mm, wait, yeah, my God shall supply all your needs according to His riches in Christ Jesus. Ooh. You know, we sometimes quit before we get to in Christ Jesus, and that causes us to think about the blessings of God in the wrong way. He didn't say, my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory. Because glory, we know, is another word for heaven. So all of the riches in heaven is how God pays us out now. So the only way God can bless us is with money. Wait, how does that work out with a God who says you can't serve God and money? What? You see, it's not your stuff. It's God's. You see, my God shall supply all your needs. Not your wants, not your desires. He might meet some of those just because he's a gracious father. But he'll meet your needs. You don't need a Maserati. You don't need a 4,000 square foot house. You don't need a trophy bride. You need salvation. You need grace. You need mercy. Because this world will come to pass and you'll never see a U-Haul behind a hearse. The stuff doesn't matter. My God shall supply all of my needs according to His riches in the glory of Christ Jesus. You see, everything I need, I got from the cross. The stuff doesn't matter. So I can then use all of the stuff to give glory to God, to give praise to God, to give thanksgiving to God. And God actually plays this out in two different sections, and if you don't read them together, you'll kind of miss it here. But God gives us His intended purpose. He gives us parallel presentations in verses 8 through 10 and verses 14 through 16. Look at them with me, because I'm going to look at both of them simultaneously. Verse 8. You shall tell your son on that day, saying, drop down to 14. It shall be when your son asks you in the time to come, saying, what is this? Then you shall say to him, why is it that we celebrate holidays? To perpetuate the thanksgiving. There is a reason that 400 years after the first thanksgiving, we're still celebrating thanksgiving, because your mama taught you how. You celebrate Thanksgiving because it's what we do. It's part of our culture. It's part of our heritage. It's part of our inheritance. God says, I want you to do this remembrance and I want you to teach your kids and I want you to teach your kids' kids and your kids' kids' kids. Keep this going because it's still my stuff and you still need to remember that. Look just below on both of those. It is because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. With a powerful hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt with the hand of, from the house of slavery. It came about when Pharaoh was stubborn about letting us go that the Lord killed every firstborn of the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of beast. Therefore, I sacrifice to the Lord the males, the first offspring of every womb and of every firstborn of my sons, I redeem. I do this to remind me of the benefit of God. I do this because God said so. He said, be thankful. Live in the abundance of the life that I've given you. Take the stuff that I've offered you. But you are a steward and remember, I own it. So celebrate to me with the stuff I gave you. I gave you the sweet roll so that you could have a party. Stick a candle in it, light it, blow it out, sing songs, let's have a feast. But don't tell me that you are creator of the cinnamon roll. It's not yours. I gave it to you to enjoy and to praise and to give thanksgiving. And these two, these two finish out. Check this out. 
Verse 10, it shall serve as a sign to you on your hand and as a reminder on your forehead that the law of the Lord may be in your mouth. For with a powerful hand the Lord brought you out of Egypt. Therefore, you shall keep this ordinance at its appointed time from year to year. Jump down to 16. So it shall serve as a sign on your hand and as phylacteries on your forehead. For with a powerful hand the Lord brought us out of Egypt. <sighs> Unless you've ever lived somewhere near an Orthodox Jewish community, you have no idea what a phylactery is. But a phylactery was actually this little leather box that they would strap to their hands and they strap to their foreheads and it actually has little writings of the word of the Torah rolled up inside of them and in those things so that they might keep the law of the Lord close to their hands and close to their heads because that's what God said to do. Yes, but you missed the point. God isn't interested that we wear little leather boxes. The phylactery is an image for us to remember that if we are thankful all the time, it should be like, like the skin on the back of our hands. It's always there. It's always what we see first. It's, how many of you guys at some point looked down and saw your parents' fingers? Like, dude, that looks like my mom's. We pay attention to hands. We know hands. And God says, I want my law, I want my godness, I want your stewardship, I want your thanksgiving to be like the skin on the back of your hand. What's the first thing we give to somebody in our culture? Hi, how are you? We give them our hand. Because what our faith is should be evident in all that we do. That thanksgiving should be a part of every single part of our life. Our recognition is He's God and we're not, and the stuff is His. That should be an everyday thing. The other side of that is, <laughs> my hands are always before my eyes. Whether you look at my hands or not, I do. Can't even avoid it when I'm driving down the road. There they are again. I'm going to write something down. Oh, that's right in the middle of the way, isn't it? And God says, I want that thankfulness. I want this idea of you being thankful and teaching your kids and doing these things. I want it to be like looking at the back of your hand. Every time you do it, it's a remembrance. Every time you do it, it's a reminder that I'm God and I provide for you and I love you and I've redeemed you from slavery and I have pulled you out and I have a purpose for you and I have a hope for you and I have a future for you and it's right there in front of your face. So give thanks. Every moment of every day be reminded by everything that you do to give thanks. And always on the face, on the forehead. <laughs> you do realize, of course, that that's the first thing anybody sees when they see you your forehead. So every time I look at another human being, I should be reminded of what God is doing in my life because it should be so evidenced on my forehead that you look at me and go, thankfulness, that's good. <laughs> you all know I'm not perfect at that either. I'm not throwing stones at anybody. I'm saying that's what God is saying to us. It ought to not just be on our hands to remind me. It ought to be on our forehead as a, Hi, I'm a Christian. Do you know God? Are you thankful for the things He's done in your life? This should be a bulletin board for the love of Jesus. It should be what people see. But here's how this works, guys. Do you realize that the first thing that has to happen is that you have to be convinced of God's love for you. That's why he put it right there so it's the first thing you see in the morning. To remind you, I got this. I've provided for you. You see, it's not just the first thing others see in us. It should also be the first thing we see in ourselves to recognize that he's at work within us. We should see in our reflection the face of Christ. And I want you to notice one more thing before we leave this part of it. That the sanctification of the firstborn and the Passover are forever linked in Exodus 13. 
For God gave His only begotten Son to be the sin, Lamb that takes away the sin of the world. There is thanksgiving in a box. We close out with verses 17 through 22. God Himself leads the people. Picking up in verses 21 through 22, the Lord going before them in a pillar of cloud by day to lead them on the way and a pillar of fire by night to give them light and they might travel by day and by night. He did not take away the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. Moses was not the leader. He was following a cloud. He was following a a fire. He was the first follower. That was his job. We as God's people should be on the lookout not for God's leader, but for the pillar of God's glory. He does not take it out from before us. So I've never seen that pillar of fire. <laughs> I know that job's been taken over by the Holy Spirit. The pillar of cloud by day, <laughs> you've probably got one sitting in your lap. God's never taken it from before our eyes. We still know the direction we're supposed to go. Do you realize how easy it was in the middle of a desert among two and a half million people to make a wrong turn? You can go off that way if you want to. <laughs> I've been in the desert. There are no landmarks. Wait, that grain of sand looks just like that grain of sand. And they've got friends. Where am I? So the reality is, God gave us a guidance on a flat plane to say, hey, this is where you need to go. We can get lost and go off in our own direction because we see that little oasis on the horizon over there, that little flicker in the air because of that thermal dynamic, and we think, oh, there's water over there, and we walk away from the cloud because we got our own idea about how things ought to be done. But that cloud's been there the whole time. You can do it his way or our way. And I'll note you also. And this is tough to hear. Verses 17, 18, and 20. Now, when Pharaoh had let the people go, God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines, even though it was near. For God said the people might change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. Hence, God led the people around by the way of the wilderness to the Red Sea. And the sons of Israel went up in martial array from the land of Egypt. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's just funny to me. I'll, I'll explain in a second. Then they set out from Succoth and camped at Elam on the edge of the desert in the wilderness. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm laughing because God says, I'm going to walk you guys around war because you're going to die. <laughs> I'm not walking you through the Philistines. You're not ready for that yet. Y'all come over here. So how do they follow him? In martial array. <laughs> They're all lined up like soldiers in battle position. God's going, we're going around the war. But we need to get over there, and there's a bad guy between us and there. We need to go there. No, we're going over here. But we need to go. I know that you've said that this is the promised land. We've all seen the map. We know the promised land is. It's right over there. Let's go. Come on, God, get with the program. <laughs> you are here. You are going here. Why are we going over there? God, I think you're doing this wrong. You see, God will always provide for us the best way. And that may not be the shortest way. It may not be the way we see to go but it will always be the best way. And we need to remember that we are stewards and just follow the Master. We got one bright spot on humanity. So many times in the Pentateuch, man looks just as dumb as we are, but every once in a while we get it right. And Exodus 13, 19 
is that moment. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him. For he had made the sons of Israel solemnly swear. <laughs> Not Moses, Joseph had made the sons of Israel solemnly swear, saying, God will surely take care of you, and you shall carry my bones from here with you. You see, the reality is, this walk out of Egypt was prophesied to Abraham by God 400 years earlier. God's just fulfilling His promise. And Joseph remembered that promise. And Joseph reminded the people of that promise by saying, when God fulfills it, not if, when God does what He promised to do, take me with you. I'll be dead. I can't get up and walk. Grab my bones. Take me out of this place. I don't want to be buried in slavery either. Take me with you. But that hope, that heart, that's what we as believers should be doing for one another. That's what Paul constantly is referring to in his epistles. But encourage one another with these words. God may not be doing what you think he should be doing right now, but that's because he's doing something better. You're just the steward. Stop pretending you're in control. Stop worrying about things. Oh, wait, I think Jesus said something about worry, didn't he? He said, quit it. You're a steward. It's not your stuff. Don't worry about the timing. You're a steward. You don't hold the clock. Stop worrying about the plan. It's not your plan. You're a steward. Quit worrying about it. Just be thankful. I'm going to feed you, care for you, guide you, direct you, redeem you, save you, take you to a grand place. All I want you to do is say thanks. I remember one time when I come home from war, I ran into one individual who was absolutely adamantly opposed to the war that I had fulfilled my obligations and answered. Those of you who are from Vietnam conflict, you'll know full well what I'm talking about. Far more than I have ever experienced, and I do not equate the two. But this individual approached me in a store and started going up and down me because I happened to be dumb enough to wear my uniform to the store. And after I found out what that individual's opinion on the war was, I had the good grace in my moment because <laughs> it wasn't what I wanted to do. To look at the individual and say, the words you're looking for are thank you. You see, guys, Thanksgiving is all about God just reminding us, hey, cut through the noise for a second. The words you're looking for are thank you. I've got this. You're just my steward. Follow and obey. You see, God has provided salvation. He's provided the land. He's provided protection. He's provided guidance and direction. He's provided His presence and access to His glory. We celebrate all of that as an act of remembrance. And that remembrance shows itself through thanksgiving. We think about the firstborn, that's our first fruits, it's the best, it's our legacy. And God says, your legacy is not bound up in your children. Your legacy is bound up in me. Your legacy is not bound up in your popularity. Your legacy is bound up in me. You're not bound up in your legacy by what history will say about you. Your legacy is with me. And we avoid sin not to gain His glory, but to thank Him for it. Blessed be the tie that binds. We have heard the tie this morning. It is the love and grace of God, our Heavenly Father, that binds us together. It is the blood of Jesus that binds us together. It is the Holy Spirit's power in our lives to live as He would 
that binds us together. touchdown <laughs> pray that God might restore to us that balance in heart and mind that he is God there is no other he will share his glory with none and that we are the most prized cherished precious children of the most high God that he has promised to hold provide strengthen nurture you are but his child 